This is Our View, brought to you by the people who work for you, the proud members of the Washington Federation of State Employees. Many foster parents provide the care for our high-needs children who are medically fragile or may have severe behavior problems. The Federation of State Employees is working to give these specialized foster parents the ability to negotiate issues including compensation, health benefits, and a formal process to deal with the management of the state agency. Our work to achieve this goal started with this year's legislative session. I believe tiered licensing with a professional class of foster parents will help children even more than it will foster families. We want the right to have the opportunity for a collective bargaining unit through the union. This will allow us to finally have a real voice for ourselves and the children we serve. No group of people ever needed or deserved this privilege more. Foster parents have no way to file a grievance when they're treated badly or worse when their complaints about adverse decisions being made for their foster children go unheeded. We care deeply for the children we serve yet the treatment we receive and the low level of reimbursement and support that is offered to us has caused many of us to leave the ranks. Every day we lose more qualified yet frustrated and discouraged foster parents. We need drastic measures to get immediate results. We want change. Professional foster parents must be separated from the general pool of foster parents. This is a career and a profession. If the state wants this caliber of foster parents, then they must be respectful professionally and financially. We all have jobs and careers. Foster parents that choose to do this work, type of work should have the recognition and ability to be fairly financially compensated with benefits. Collective bargaining is critical for recruitment and retention of this type of foster parent. If this category becomes recognized as a professional field, then the state may attract more competent professionals to care for our most at-risk children. Our most at-risk children need foster parents that are skilled and competent to meet their very complex needs. This committee knows the need. You know there's a lot of kids in our system that need a lot of help and that we have done a very poor job in this state of recruiting, retaining, and developing foster parents that have the skills and the ability to deal with these difficult kids. But uh, the collective bargaining piece seems to get everybody all excited. Entering into the class is voluntary, uh, surf, uh, joining a union is voluntary, and uh, the scope of the bargaining itself is extremely modest. We think this piece makes the bill work, and we would urge you to pass it along. Thank you. Teachers in France do not put up with unfair treatment from the state. A recent proposal from the new French president that would force teachers to keep schools open during a strike caused teachers to shut down every school in the country for a day as they asked President Sarkozy, what part of no don't you understand? Last January in France, teachers went on strike for one day against new reform the Sarkozy administration wants to do. These reform concern working conditions, the suppression of over 11,000 positions in the educational sector, cutdowns on the budget for September, and a 48-hour notification before a strike with a certain service still maintained to welcome students. Des suppressions de postes Public, privé, tous ensemble dans la rue, tes salaires, on en fait. So, I'm here because I'm a teacher and uh, we are demonstrating for uh, the salaries and the suppression of uh, the jobs of uh, teachers. There, is less, there are less and less teachers. Prices have gone up by 20% in 10 years, and 8% is the change to the euro. But our salaries are still the same. Uh, the main problem is the drastic reduction of a number of teachers, and without any reflection about the structure of, uh, of the establishment of the schools, all the structures re remain the, the same. And so 
there are no real effects on the pupils, except the fact that there are, there are more pupils in the same room and the condition for, for teaching are going well. Uh, after today, uh, it's a really big uh, issue because, because of the government, of the administration, we don't know really what will go next. So, most of the teachers are really keen to go on strike next, I don't know if it next month or in next two months, but I think there will be a future strike. I'm ready to go back on strike and protest till we get satisfaction. Uh, I'm here today in order to send a strong message to our president, Nicolas Sarkozy, and to the government. Uh, our conditions of living are really, really difficult, are really difficult. Uh, we need better, uh, better wages and so on. It's, it's, it's very difficult for the population. I, I expect that the government will, will hear our message and will take good decision, practical decision for the population, for the French population. If, if, if the government doesn't do anything, there will be other, other, other strikes and I, I, will, uh, I, will, I, I will go to, the, to, the, to these strikes. Even though there have been very few teacher strikes in the past 10 years, a law regarding strikes already exists that makes unions notify school and parents five days before in order to negotiate during that time. Six out of eight civil servant unions joined in the protest with other civil servants. More could be coming with the new reforms in France. Benjamin Marcus for Our View, Paris, France. Do you think slavery has disappeared? Well, it hasn't. Children, as cheap labor, are mostly now the slaves. It is an outrage the whole world needs to care about. This bus station in Burkina Faso is a transit point for children who've been sold into exploitation, many to work on farms in neighboring Côte d'Ivoire. An estimated 200,000 children across Africa are trafficked each year, made to work in mines, farms, or as domestic workers. If you really want to fight child trafficking, you have to start here, at the bus station. The Road Transport Union is working with the International Labour Organization to stop child trafficking. The strategy is to target transit points like this bus station and raise awareness among bus drivers. Last year, over a thousand trafficked children were rescued across the country. I used to transport trafficked children because bus driving alone didn't pay enough. My conscience got to me. I am Muslim, and with the awareness raising campaign, I realized that I needed to abandon this. When Mathurin was 13, a trafficker convinced his family that he would earn a good income if they would send him to pick cotton in the Côte d'Ivoire. I didn't realize what it would be like. When I got there, there were five children. I became the sixth, and we had to do all the work. I suffered a lot. He escaped, and once back in Burkina Faso, he was put under the care of an association that provides apprenticeships to traffic children. Poverty remains the main cause of child trafficking. In order to effectively combat this problem, awareness raising isn't enough. Viable alternatives also need to be made available to parents and children. Instead of boarding a bus, Mathurin is learning to be a bike mechanic. He hopes to open a motorbike repair shop when he returns home to his village. With continued efforts like these, the bus ride may one day lead home for other children as well. A look at our Union history. Here's Ross Reeder. On your next drive through Colorado, stop at Ludlow, just off the interstate, a few miles north of Trinidad. View the United Mine Workers Monument and a pit dug under a former tent site. Women and children died of suffocation 
in this pit when on April 20th, 1914, state militia attacked striking workers and their families in the tent community at Ludlow. By the way, April 20th, 2008, is the Jewish observation of Passover, recognizing the time when Jews gained their freedom from Egyptian slavery. The conflict, back to Ludlow, between members of the United Mine Workers and the John D. Rockefeller-owned Colorado Fuel and Iron Company began in 1913 over union recognition as well as the appalling conditions. More than 9,000 miners in the fall of 1913 quit company property and set up tents on adjacent land. They were protesting against being forced to live in a company town, being paid with company scrip, and working more than the eight-hour day that was on the statute books. In the winter of 1914, state militia was called in to dislodge the workers from their tent town. One night, after a series of unsuccessful tries, the troopers riddled the tents with bullets. The troops poured oil on the tents and set them on fire. Eleven children and two women who had taken refuge in the hole you can view at Ludlow were burned to death or suffocated. By the time the workers were defeated, 33 men, women, and children had been shot or burned to death. The mine operators won the strike, reported the United Mine Workers Journal. But old John D. lost some of his public affection and had to begin the practice of giving away dimes to pl placate opinion. <laughs> This has been Our View, brought to you by the members of the Washington Federation of State Employees. We remind you that when you accept a paycheck for your hard work, you don't give up your rights. Thank you for watching, and please join us again.